Hey guys, Eric Bischoff here to talk to you about my friends over at SaveWithConrad.com. Are you looking to get out of debt? Conrad and his team can make that happen faster than me firing the hockey talk man. Wow. And you know that controversy creates cash, right? Do you know what doesn't create cash? Credit card debt. Save with Conrad can help you consolidate high interest credit cards and all of your other debt into one low monthly payment. They can even help you get the cash you need for home improvements or anything else. They've helped 83 weeks listeners save 500, 600, 700, even $800 a month. Seriously, your papers are going to go down faster than nitro ratings in 2000. Ouch! And how about this? No house payments for two months. That's right, no house payments for two months. And unlike the dirt sheets, man, the reviews do not lie. With over 1,000 five-star reviews, find out for yourself how much Conrad and his team can save you by checking out savewithconrad.com today. Be grateful you did. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo! Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. And today we're doing something a little different. We're paying homage to the late, great Eddie Guerrero. We were supposed to do this around his birthday, but Eric and I got caught up talking about everything that's going on in wrestling these days. Of course, you can catch Eric later this week with John Alba when they're doing their show, Strictly Business. They're going to talk about the business of professional wrestling and I'm sure there will be lots of current stuff in that conversation, but today, man, we're going to talk about all the times we've brought up Eddie Guerrero and what would have been his 56th birthday. It's hard to believe that Eddie would have been 56. Like that's not old. You know, you think about some of the great performers we see on TV right now, and I can't help but think what a great impact Eddie would have had in the ring and behind the scenes. It's just gone way, way too soon. I guess next month will be like. Is that 19 years that we will have been without Eddie? Um, well today we're going to be talking about, uh, and playing you some highlights from all the times he's come up here on the show. Uh, Eddie Guerrero, of course, was a mainstay and in Lucha Libre. And then I first saw him, uh, not when worlds collide, I wasn't watching that, but man, nitro, he was just a force to be reckoned with. I didn't start watching nitro, I guess, until August of 96. But fast forward, and man, his performance against Rey Mysterio, there ain't nothing like it. Halloween Havoc 1997. We're going to talk about that and so much more here on today's episode. A very special 83 weeks celebrating the late, great Eddie Guerrero. And let's get things started with uh, Eric Bischoff talking about bringing Eddie into WCW. Do I think, look, when Eddie came in, uh, I... I was aware of Eddie, but not close. You know, I wasn't watching him closely. Eddie was working as Elgato in New Japan. I think it was Elgato was his gimmick in Japan. And I was working closely with New Japan. And I know Masa Saito really appreciated Eddie and and liked him a lot. And the reason that Eddie became a conversation between myself and, and Masa Saito was because they wanted they wanted to keep Eddie booked as, as often as they could, but they couldn't put him on a full time or w- weren't willing, I guess, to put him on a full under contract. So when I talked to Masa about what I wanted to do with the cruiserweight division, well before I had my first conversation with Eddie or you know Chris Benoit or any of those, I had <clears throat> had the idea for the cruiserweight division. And I was talking to Masa about it because a lot of the talent that I saw that would really help make up that, that division, that, that talent would have come from new Japan pro wrestling. Right. So it was Masai Saito that said, no, man, you get hire Eddie. If you can put Eddie under contract, I, I guarantee you, I will book him X amount of days a year. Well, the reason that that was important and it was a financial it was a good financial play on my part is because as I'm adding talent to the roster, I've got to figure out, okay, as best I can, 
how, how do I justify this? How, how does this make sense financially? So if I hire a guy, and I, whatever I hired Eddie at, I think I brought him in at 175 or whatever it was, whatever the number was. Um, I had Masa Saido sitting across from me at the table saying, well, I'll cover half. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the nature of the relationship that went beyond occasional booking opportunities and, you know, things we did on TV, the real opportunity for me to help me manage. Cause again, at this time we weren't profitable, right? We we're getting close. So these decisions, despite the, the fact that the, you know, Meltzer and, and Vince McMahon were out there laying the groundwork for this, this bullshit narrative of, Oh, you just write a check. It doesn't have to justify it. Bullshit. At that time I had to justify everything. But when I'm sitting across and I got my Ma, Saito and Brad ring is saying, no, Eddie grow. Awesome. We would, and if you hire him and you put him under contract and we have this deal, we'll eat half his contract. So now I'm getting a guy for 80 or 90 grand a year. Yeah. A badass. Pretty good deal. Now, did you, did I see him as potentially being in that top spot at WCW at the time? Of course not. And, and nobody else would have, that was no. in the right mind, right? Eddie made it to where he made it in WWE as a result of how well he built himself, how well he did for himself, how well he performed, how well he created his own character. I didn't do that for Eddie. Eddie did that for Eddie. I gave Eddie the opportunity and I said, wow, this is good. But that was all on Eddie. It wasn't on me. It wasn't on anybody else. But had Eddie not gone through everything he went through at WCW, he would not have been in WWE. End of conversation. It wasn't like WWE would have seen the handwriting on the wall with Eddie Guerrero in 1995 or 96 or 97, or 98 or 99 for that matter, or 2000. Had it not been for the success that Eddie created for himself in WCW. But while he was creating that success, success, did I ever see him as a potential? No. And in reality, even in 2020 hindsight, sitting here being really honest about it, I just don't think because of the time and the context of timing, you know, I'm starting to sound like Kamala Harris. It's all about the time and the essence of time and the passage of time within the context of time. Sorry. Flip me out. I saw it this morning on the news uh, to be able to sit here and honestly say, yeah, I could see how Eddie could have done it. It's, that would be pandering to this audience and I won't do it. I just won't do it. Okay. So you heard me mention at the top of the show that I was not watching when worlds collide, but you, you look back at that show and you see so many pivotal talent that were a part of that show, Eddie Guerrero amongst them. We have talked about that here on the program with Eric. So we're going to talk about Eddie and art bars performance on when worlds collide. We'll also touch on why Eddie didn't hire art bar. And then we're going to fast forward to a conversation that we had about Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko at Starcade. Um, it's an interesting time, you know, Eddie's career in WCW. If you read his book, you'll see that he was very, very frustrated. You know, he wanted so much more than what was available to him. And, uh, it was, he didn't always talk about his time in WCW so glowingly. So we're going to touch on some of that as we move on here. We should mention the next match is what everybody is talking about. And you've heard about it. I'm sure it's octagon and El Hio Del Santo taking on love machine and Eddie Guerrero. Love machine is art bar. It's two out of three falls. It's double mask versus double hair. It's 22 minutes and 29 seconds. Meltzer would say live. This was one of the best matches he's ever seen. And one of the two best matches of the year in the United States, he gave it five stars. Of course, art bar and Eddie Guerrero lose. And as a result have most of their hair cut off with scissors before going backstage and having the rest taken off with trimmers. Uh, but this is, um, uh, Quite the performance Meltzer would ride on the heels of this show. Love machine in some aspects is the best all around performer in the group. And Eddie Guerrero was easily the best pure wrestler on the card that night. This is, uh, unfortunately the last, I mean, really the big break that art bar had been looking for. He had bounced around a little bit. He had a little bit of trouble, uh, with Rod in, in the Northwest. And then he would pop up in WCW as the juicer, which is basically a Beetlejuice ripoff. He's looking for the success that a lot of people say his talent deserves. He has maybe the best frog splash in the history of the business. Eddie Guerrero would use that for the rest of his career as a tribute to art bar. 
And I say tribute because just seven days at 17 days after this show, um, unfortunately art bar would pass away. So this is really his biggest match, most important match, most notable match, but sadly one of his last as well. When you saw what art bar was capable of here, we know you're going to bring in Eddie Guerrero. What were the plans for art bar? I mean, did you think, God, what can I do with this guy? I didn't really, you know, I was interested in Eddie. And again, we've talked about this, you know, six months or a year ago. You know, the reason that Eddie and Chris and Dean came in is because of their association with New Japan Pro Wrestling. Art Bar didn't have that association. At least I don't think he did at the time. So, you know, I didn't bring Eddie in because of the performance that occurred on the show. I brought Eddie in eventually because of the the, the long-term relationship that I had with New Japan Pro Wrestling. So, the, you know, I'm not taking anything away from Art Bar, but he, he wasn't on my radar. Eddie became on my radar because of that relationship with New Japan. Well, if you're listening to this show and you're looking for one match to watch, you need to go watch this one. Octagon and Ohio Dos Santo taking on Love Machine and Eddie Guerrero. Two out of three falls. One of the best matches you'll ever see. Let's get to Starcade. Your opening match is a hell of a match. It only gets two and three quarters in the uh, star rating in the Observer. But Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko, man, I wish every pay-per-view still started that way. Meltzer would say this was the best match on the show, but well below the standard you'd expect from these two. Uh, and I think a lot of this is probably because, and I could be wrong. This crowd is here for the main event. They're here for Hogan sting. And it's probably hard to get them behind, uh, you know, a, a, a cruiserweight title match. And it, it is different from a traditional show in that regard, because it felt like Starcade 97 people were really counting the days down to see the payoff of this sting Hogan match. what do you think of this Eddie Dean Malenko opener? <laughs> You know, I, I agree with Dave uh, to a certain degree. I thought the match was was, was a great match. I don't think it was one of the better ones. Um, I, I don't think it was the best match on the card. You know, we'll talk about Kurt Heading and DDP a little bit later. But the one thing that I did notice in watching the match back is for an Eddie and Dean match, it was a slower paced match. And again, one of the things I love about doing this show with you and, and, you know, kind of being forced and not against my will, but being motivated to go back and look at some of this stuff is the way I look at it now and the way I looked at it then. And I think for me now, because certainly I wasn't, you know, I didn't get involved in matches. I didn't tell people or suggest or even pay attention to how matches were laid out. I left that to other people who were more experienced than me. But today... I would have sat down with these guys and had a conversation about, you know, okay, here, here's who you guys are as characters. Here's what the audience expectation is of you guys as characters in this cruiserweight world, which is, you know, an extremely important part of who WCW is right now and who, and the success that Nitro has experienced is because of you, Dean and you, Eddie, and here's what this match needs to, to be. And instead of it being however long it was, I didn't look at the time on it, but it was a long segment. It was a good 12, 14 minutes minimum, um, maybe more. Eddie and Dean should have had a faster pace match that looked more cruiserweight ish than this one did. It was a great match. Don't get me wrong. And I'm, I'm going to go on record right now. I'm going to start a Dean Malenko fan club here on, on 83 weeks because every time I go back and look at something, you know, that we're going to be talking about. And every time Dean Malenko's in it, I say to myself, damn, he, he, without question, one of the most underrated talents, you know, in WCW and for the minimal amount of time he was in WWE. He is so good. His character is so believable from the minute he walks through a curtain. People should study young guys and girls coming up in the business should look at Dean Malenko and study him in, in terms of his ability as an actor, as a performer, whatever you want to call him, his ability to make you believe the minute he walks out to the ring. He creates one of my biggest bitches when I watch wrestling, and not so much when I watch it anymore, because I don't I don't watch it for the same reasons anymore. But you know, when I was writing and and especially the last few years of my career, 
you know, I used to beat people over the head. You know, Bully Ray, if we ever, if you ever interview Bully, you know, to ask him to tell you about the time in, in creative meetings at TNA when I would just beat my fists almost bloody, pounding on the table, trying to get people to understand and invest in the idea that in order for any storyline to matter, there has to be stakes that people believe. You can't just throw out gimmicks and expect people to invest in silly ass gimmicks with no meaning, no connection to a story, no connection to the characters, just a gimmick for the sake of a gimmick. It used to drive me fucking batshit. Still does. I'll get myself worked into a fucking lather here if I think about it much longer. But Dean had the amazing ability and talent that could he would walk out. And I mean within three seconds of the camera, you know, being on Dean, he would make you believe that in his mind those stakes were incredibly high. That match was the most important thing in his life in that particular moment. And the ability to do that, and it's subtle, you know, it's not like you you can't overact that. You can't overproduce that. It's just you either have that natural acting ability and believability or you don't and dean had it in spades he's so good at it eddie is eddie you know we 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 keep eddie on a pedestal deservedly so for so many different ways but from a producer's perspective just please go back and look at dean malenko look at every little thing that he does because everything that he does is not only believable but you get the sense that to him as a performer it's incredibly important the most important thing, you know, in his world at that particular moment in a match. Okay, I'm done putting over Dean Malenko. Well, I'm Dean, glad. You can, Dean, you can send me a box of steaks for Christmas if you want. <laughs> let's um, let's talk about the next match here. Probably the match of the show. Uh, it's going to get four and a quarter stars here. They get 13 minutes and 43 seconds where Otani pins Eddie Guerrero. A lot of people still talk about this one. Uh, maybe one of the better matches that we saw at a Starcade. Certainly the best match on this one. What'd you think? I'm going to watch it again. I mean, it was, I was blown away. I was blown away. I mean, I, I don't know that ma- if that match could happen today, God, we're willing. And we could put that match on today. That match would stand up to any show in any company, any place in the world today. And we're talking about 23 years ago. You talk about being ahead of your time. You talk about being on the cutting edge. You know, this match had everything. And what's really interesting, Conrad, is over, you know, the holiday, you know, Christmas and a couple of days after, I'm kind of, you know, you get bored sitting around the house doing nothing. So I start, you know, going back and forth with fans on Twitter, sometimes just for the fun of it. And sometimes you get into some really interesting conversations. And somebody posted a couple of days ago, you know, their frustration, I'm going to paraphrase it, but their frustration in that, you know, all matches now are just nothing but high spots. Nothing means anymore. There's no good stories anymore. And I kind of posited the question or the statement, you know, it doesn't have to be binary. It doesn't have to be, it's all high flying, crazy, athletic, super, you know, crazy moves, suicide moves and no story. There's got to be a way to find that balance. And, and we went back and forth on, in that discussion it, it, in my opinion, it's not so much that it can't be done. It's just people have chosen not to do it or don't feel the need to do it, that they've replaced good storytelling and psychology in a wrestling match with shit that makes you go, ooh. And that's it that happens. It's just the evolution of the business. But I think there's going to be people who are going to rise to the next level who are capable of delivering that kind of um, very progressive, highly evolved, athletic type of high-flying match, but still – have good story. It doesn't have to be one or the other. And then I watched this after going back and forth on Twitter. And then I sat down to watch this show and I went, there's a perfect example. I mean, this match was a perfect example of believable, well-executed, super athletic, high flying, fast paced, stiff action, but it still told a great story in the ring. And this, this would be my example of what wrestling could and should look like in 2019 and 2020, because it is possible. And these two guys did it in 1995. There you go. If you haven't already go out of your way to go find this one, it's a hell of a match. Uh, Otani is going to go on to be the first cruiserweight champion in March of 96. 
he would defeat Benoit in the finals of that tournament in Japan. And, uh, Benoit was working there as wild Pegasus. Eventually Otani would go on to lose the belt to Dean Malenko. Uh, he would win the wrestling observer, best technical wrestler award in 99. He did the J crown, the IWGP junior title. He even held the WWF light heavyweight title once he's still not retired. Uh, but this is about as good as it's going to get. Go out of your way to watch it. Man, you're going to get to see the angle of your seat with our friends at game time. This has been a game changer for me. I know not too long ago, Dave Silva used this to get his kids incredible tickets to see the Jonas brothers. I think sister had more fun than brother. Uh, but boy, it was all smiles at my house when I was able to get last minute. I'm talking about just hours before the show front row seats, uh, for, I think her name's Lana Del Rey. I don't know, but my daughter absolutely said I made her life complete. And it was way cheaper than if I had went to any other site and game time hooked me up. Talk about a, a great deal and a great concept. Game time gets you last minute, great deals on all of the events like flash deals, last minute tickets, zone deals. They're going to hook you up and they take all the stress and worry about, oh man, tickets went on sale for this three months ago. It sold out. What do I do? What do you do? You go to game time. They'll give you a view from every seat in the venue. So it removes the risk of, and the worry of, well, is this a good seat? What am I really paying for? But at the same time, they've got the lowest price guarantee. Now let me explain how that works. The game time guarantee means you always get the best price. So if you find tickets in the same section and same row for less money and game time hooks you up, they credit you 110% of the difference. So you get the peace of mind of knowing what your seat's going to look like. And at the same time, the peace of mind of knowing you got the best deal possible. Not only that, they've got exclusive flash sales and sponsored deals for everything like football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. We love game time. I'm a true blue believer. You will be too. And how about this? We want you to take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. So download the game time app, create an account and use our code weeks. That's W E E K S for $20 off your first purchase terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem with code weeks. That's W E E K S and you're at $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So now we've also had a chance to uh, recap some, well, interesting moments in Eddie's career in WCW. He once teamed with, uh, his pal, Billy Kidman and his great close personal friend, Ray Mysterio to take on the insane clown posse in Vampiro. Uh, yeah. How about this? Not only that, it happened at road wild. Yeah. So one of those outdoor shows in Sturgis right after that, we're going to switch to a conversation about Conan and Eddie Guerrero hooking it up at uncensored 99. They got plenty of time on a pay-per-view. You know, this is very much the Monday night war era here in 99. So if there was a TV match, it was usually two, three, four, five, six minutes. So to get on pay-per-view for 19 minutes was a big dog on deal. We'll also touch on Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio from world war three. Uh, this is probably not the match that you're expecting us to talk about with them on pay-per-view. We are talking about Halloween havoc 97, but man, they followed it up the next month at world war three with a pretty damn amazing match in their own right. Uh, we'll also talk about, uh, uncensored 98. We've got Eddie Guerrero wrestling Booker T, which on paper seems like a dream match, but well, uh, maybe Eric's a little critical of that one. So we'll cover Eddie Guerrero and Booker T in three other matches, starting with Conan right here. Let's keep it going. This is a, a fun show for what it is. Uh, this is probably my favorite of the, uh, road wall shows. Uh, maybe it's just because I had a good time watching it at the time. And I still remember where I watched it, but even though this is a the most hodgepodge group of performers ever. It's a pretty fun match. Your first one, it's Rey Mysterio, Billy Kidman, and Eddie Guerrero. It's a lot of talent on one side. And on the other side, well, it's Vampiro and the insane clown posse. Raven is at ringside here. Uh, the match is okay. According to Meltzer it says, although you'd expect more than okay for a match involving Mysterio, you know, junior Kidman and Guerrero. And he says that ICP did fine considering the level of experience. And of course the finish sees Vampiro accidentally kick shaggy two dope and Guerrero does a Pescado on Vampiro and then Kidman pins shaggy after the shooting star press two and a quarter stars. 
the idea of this being like a, a six man with Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio on one side, it does feel sort of Lucha esque, which I kind of like, but the insane clown posse in here with some of the best wrestlers in the world, clearly they need that as sort of garnish to bring them up a level, but it does feel like maybe we could have done a little more with some great in ring talent than have them wrestle clowns. What say you? Yeah, I, I can't, uh, I can't just listening to you lay that out the way you just did it kind of made me go, Ooh, Oh, and you're right. You know, when you've got as much talent as you had on one side of the ring, um, you would expect a great match out of it, but keep in mind, they've got to have somebody to work with and the insane cloud posse. were not anywhere near the level of experience or abilities, uh, that their opponents were, bringing to the table so you you would you know looking back at it now i wish i wouldn't have booked it i'm sure on paper it can it made some kind of storyline sense but if you can't execute that story in the ring no matter how good it is on paper if it doesn't come off well in the ring it's it's going to go flat and i can imagine that this went pretty flat you don't need to sell this first match man these guys are working their ass off conan retains the united states title against eddie guerrero in nearly 19 minutes and, um, I really enjoyed this match. I know that, uh, some of the uh, reports were that it could have been better, blah, blah, blah. Meltzer gave it three and a quarter stars. I thought it was good stuff though. Uh, Meltzer would write the negative about doing the low blow finish was that they did about 30 low blows the rest of the show without any leading to a pin. what did you think of the match watching it back for the first time in more than 20 years? I uh, yeah, a couple of things that jumped out at me, uh, right off the bat. Uh, number one, you know, 19 minutes for a Conan match is a long damn time. Yeah. And I, and I was, when I was watching it back on WWE network, of course you could see where the segments break. And as this thing started out, I went, Holy cow, this is going to be a really long match. And for a guy like Eddie, uh, you know, his match, you know, you needed enough time to really, you know, tell the story, you know, beginning, middle and an end, look for some good transitions that were emotional. So the audience is engaged so that at the finish of the match, you've reached the crescendo. I mean, that's the basic, you know, structure of a match. And I thought, well, 19 minutes is a long time to, for a guy like Eddie, who is a faster paced, you know, that's the thing about cruiserweights or, or certainly was back then, at least is the pace of that match was much faster, which means that you need to be able to cram all of that, story and psychology and the three acts that you typically would want to have into something that is a little bit more um, consistent with the style of match these guys have. If you go out there and burn the barn down for 19 minutes, by the time you're getting to the finish, unless you're in super good shape, you're going to be kind of dragging ass and the finish of the match. Isn't going to be as good as the, probably the body of the match and probably not nearly as good as the opening of the match. So that was my, thought going in. Um, I was pleasantly surprised watching it back, you know, recently, uh, this morning, as a matter of fact, on St. Patrick's Day, no less. I'm watching wrestling that's 20 some odd years old. But what I was really pleasantly surprised about was how great Conan looked. Um, he, I, this may have been the best in ring presentation that Conan, Conan possibly ever had in WCW. Not saying that he didn't have more important roles and in more important scenes, but if you just look at the body of the match from bell to bell and how it played out in the ring, I thought Conan did a phenomenal job. Eddie's Eddie. He's always he's always phenomenal. But Conan, I felt, was really, really on top of his game in, in, in the ring with working with Eddie. If you go back and watch the match, hit that 950 uh, time code somewhere in that area, a tremendous sequence of moves back and forth between Eddie and and, and, um, and Conan and Conan looked particularly great. The stakes I thought were really well laid out. The fact that, you know, the, the backstory of the, you know, these two guys being friends and then the audience kind of anticipating who's going to turn, who's going to get to that point in the middle of the match where they're going to, you know, throw their friendship out the window and get, get down and dirty. You know, that was established, you know, pretty early on, um, the low blow, I got to tell you, I'm going to call Conan next week and ask him because it was such, first of all, I went back and watched it two or three times and I watched the replay two or three times. I didn't even see the low blow. It looked to me like Eddie basically nutted himself as he was coming over the top of Conan. 
uh, because it was so awkward. And I could see Conan talking to Eddie on the cover. And the way Eddie was selling, it was not a theatrical sell. Uh, it, if it was, it was a poorly done one. And that wasn't Eddie's forte, doing things poorly when it came to selling. That, that finish looked so awkward. And I swear to God, I can't imagine anybody, even sitting at ringside, saw the low blow. You know, Dave's comments notwithstanding, which, by the way, I would probably agree with without even having noticed it in the rest of these matches, is that was one of the flaws in, in WCW is, you know, guys going out there and repeating the same things that had happened in the match before, particularly high spots or heat spots, um, as Dave is probably referring to here. But I, I just looking at this match as a standalone, uh, if you go back and look at that finish, I, um, I'm pretty sure that that was an improv type of finish because it just was so awkward and uncharacteristic for Eddie. Next up, we got Eddie Guerrero and Rey Mysterio. As you might imagine, this is the best match on the show. If you're going to watch one match from this show, it's got to be this one. It gets four stars in the Observer. They get plenty of time, 12 minutes, 42 seconds. You know, they just tore the house down at Halloween Havoc the month prior. I still think that one's one of the best matches of all time, but this is pretty damn good. Had the Halloween Havoc show not existed, you got to think this would have been, you know, their best match. Uh, Mike Tanay points out on commentary, there's a poster in the crowd about this being the three-year anniversary of the death of Eddie Guerrero's former partner, Art Barr. Uh, Lots of intricate spots here, incredible frog splashes and power bombs, and they're pulling out all the stops. I absolutely love it. Eddie gets the win. He retains the cruiserweight title. I don't think it mattered to me who won. I mean, this was such a good match that by the end, uh, I was just glad I got to see it. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I, I mean, I agree with you all the way across the board. I think the, the Halloween Havoc match was absolutely the best. I mean, that match was so crisp and the pace was so fast and there was, there was nothing that wasn't spectacular about that match. This match wasn't quite as good. And there were a couple beats. If you go back and really break this match down and look at it very, very closely, you'll 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 find probably two or three um, spots in this match where timing was a little off, positioning was a little off. Um, once or twice, either Eddie or Ray, I couldn't really tell which one, wasn't really sure where they were at. But they made up for it so quickly that unless you really put this match under a microscope, you wouldn't recognize it. Uh, and I'm being I'm being super critical here because this match is fantastic, and by any other standard or by all other standards, uh, probably one of the best you've seen in that year. We start with a barn burner, but it only gets two and a half stars. But look at the talent in this man. Booker T retaining his television title, pinning Eddie Guerrero in 11 minutes and eight seconds. Guerrero has his reluctant nephew Chavo Jr. here in tow as a result of a stipulation in a match that took place on Thunder three days prior. And uh, after Eddie loses the match, he argues with Chavo, throws him into the guardrail, and Meltzer says this post match stuff is going to get old and hurry. Two and a half stars. But it is good that you've got, you know, an angle here involving Chavo on TV, one of his first major things like this on television. what did you think of the match watching it back for the first time in a long time this week? And before I get to the match, I'd like to talk about the open of the show just for a second. Sure. You know, if, if somebody listening to the show is an aspiring announcer or an active announcer, uh, or, or, or producer for that matter, go back and watch the open of this particular pay-per-view with Bobby and, uh, Tanae and Tony, they did such a great job of framing this event and building anticipation for it and setting the context, you know, and really context in the sense of where the stories are and what the stakes are and what the possibilities could be for this particular evening. It really, that open really, I think more than anything I've seen going back and watching some of these, and I've seen some good ones, you know, this is a great team of announcers. I think they probably don't get nearly enough credit as a team as they should, probably should sometimes. But if you go back and listen to Bobby especially, because he he listens to everything everybody else said, but he puts a great button on the end of it that really drives the stakes, the potential danger, the risks, all of that. And he does it in a very believable way. Now, as far as the match goes, you know, I was a little, 
I was, eh, I was probably more like Dave about this than anything. And I think even just watching it back, um, I was immediately disappointed within the first two two minutes uh, of watching it back because I don't remember. I didn't remember it. I had to go back and watch it to to remind myself. And I think you know when it came up, I thought, oh, this is going to be a great match, another great Eddie Guerrero match. And it, it's not that it was a bad match by any stretch of the imagination. The match was a solid match, technically speaking. And there's a couple of little flaws in it, but not many. Um, but I think th- it was a real slow match for Eddie. You know, my my expectation as a fan and as a producer, my expectation whenever you see Eddie, especially coming out in the beginning of a pay per view. Typically, what we try to do is start off real hot, you know, and really capture the audience's imagination and, and satisfy them. You know, my, my theory on that was if you start hot, you can find a way to get hot in the middle and you end on a note that, you know, will have people talking. Overall, people are going to enjoy that pay-per-view. And this match, as good as it was in so many different ways, I love the psychology in the match. I really do. I love the storytelling in the match. But because for Eddie, the pace of this match was so much slower than what I expected to see, it kind of left me feeling just a little bit flat and disappointed. That's that's my take. And I like the next match even better. This is one you should go out of your way to see. Uh, Eddie Guerrero and Six have a ladder match here for the United States belt. It's an excellent four-star match, according to the Observer. I thought it was tremendous. They go 13 minutes and 48 seconds. Eddie gets the win. So now he is in possession of the U S title. Uh, Meltzer would say, uh, this was an excellent match. Although one wouldn't have known it since the announcers absolutely killed the match. Bischoff spent more time trying to get over that. He knows karate and that Scott Hall invented ladder matches than build drama into a damn good match. Most people didn't even recognize this as anything more than an average match when it was really a great effort by both four stars. The finish sees both at the top of the ladder, each come down, holding the belt. Guerrero manages to hit six with the belt and takes the bump to the floor while Guerrero climbs down with the belt. What'd you think? I thought it was pretty exciting. You know, WCW here to four, it wasn't really known for the best gimmick type matches. Um, they were usually sloppy, uh, sometimes horrible in their execution. This was the antithesis of that. This was really good. This was really fast paced. Both of these guys did a good, good job. Um, what I was trying to put over, not myself, but as a play by play guy who, by the way, actually is a black or was a black belt and spent, you know, a decade or more in martial arts. I was taking, I was using my knowledge to put over Sean Waltman, not trying to put myself over, but Dave through his fucked up color, colored glasses wouldn't have recognized that. I really did put Sean over and his real knowledge of martial arts. And if you go back and listen to my commentary, <clears throat> I talk about how oftentimes people talk about, you know, the fact that they're martial artists or in, in the case of this particular show, they took three months worth of karate classes at the local YMCA and then run around telling everybody know they know karate until they get their ass kicked because they don't really know shit. And I use that to try to put over Sean because Sean's use of martial arts um, were legitimate in the ring. If you look at the move that Sean did, and it surprised me in, in real – in fact, it surprised me again seeing it. Sean executed – now he missed. He was slightly off target, which is understandable since he was standing on a fucking ladder with another guy. But when he jumped and did what's called technically a sidekick or a jump sidekick, he missed Eddie just by a, a touch. Um but the kick itself, from a technical point of view, was almost flawless. And it really did impress the fuck out of me. It, it, it impressed the hell out of me watching it back. It was a great match. If you've never seen this one, we're going to dump on this show. We have been consistently. Go back and watch this one. I'm not going to say it's WrestleMania with Razor and Sean, but very, very good. You know, there are make or break times in everyone's career. And man, Eddie had an opportunity to have some big time opponents in 1996. We're going to talk about that, uh, where Eddie would team up with Arn Anderson to take on Ric Flair and Randy Savage in 1996. What a big opportunity that was for Eddie. We'll also talk about Eddie and Flair working together at hog wild for the U S title. Uh, yeah. One of those outdoor shows, the very first one back in 1996, 
Then we'll touch on Eddie Guerrero and DDP for the battle bowl ring. Um, maybe the battle bowl ring wasn't such a bad idea. You know, I used to make fun of that whole concept, but I mean, AEW is like the ring idea and I guess it's kind of a cool idea, but still it felt like Eddie Guerrero and DDP wrestled about a hundred times. Uh, it was all about that battle bowl ring. Then we'll talk about a pretty incredible match and some incredible talent here from December 23rd, 1996, just a couple of days before Christmas on nitro, we were treated to Eddie Guerrero versus Chris, Chris Benoit. And I don't think anybody would have ever predicted, uh, that just a handful of years after that, remember that's almost 1997 right there. So you're saying seven years and change later, both of these guys would be world champs in WWE. It's hard to imagine, but, uh, we'll talk about that match and so much more. Here we go. But Hey, here's two good matches. Let's talk about them. Flair and Randy Savage on one side are going to be Eddie Guerrero and Arn Anderson on the other. So now let's talk about this. You've got the horsemen split apart. Rick on one side, Arn on the other. Let me run through the list again. Rick Flair, Randy Savage, Arn Anderson, and Eddie Guerrero. This is a big opportunity for Guerrero here. I mean, no matter how you slice it, he's going to be wrestling Randy Savage and Ric Flair. And this is early 1996. This is before Eddie Guerrero was in that upper echelon of conversation as far as American television wrestling to being a quote unquote top guy. Certainly he could, he could be cruiserweight champ or TV champ or us champ, but we're still, I don't know, years away from Eddie being considered world championship caliber, but he's wrestling Randy Savage and Ric Flair who are a lot of people's Mount Rushmore's. This is a big opportunity for Eddie, right? It was and Eddie took advantage of it, man. I think Eddie looked good in this match and I love, you know, this match had backstory. Yes. This, this match had a reason to exist. Whereas all of the other matches, other than, you know, the curiosity factor didn't, and there was no backstory and there was no psychology in the match. And there was no reason for those matches to happen other than, you know, the sheer rant for a lot of reasons. Um, but this match did make sense. It did have backstory. It was going forward. This was a probably end of act one, early act two story in, in, in Ric Flair's saga at that point and his relationship to Arn Anderson. This match had the potential of seeing Arn, you know, being involved in defeating Rick. Didn't work out that way. It worked out the opposite. It was really good storytelling. And the match itself was really fun to watch. I enjoyed this one. Let's break down the match here. Meltzer would say Flair and Anderson worked together much of the way, beating on Savage. Guerrero saved Savage from Flair, and Flair and Guerrero started working together, which got great heat. As Guerrero took over on Flair, Savage recovered and attacked Flair. Anderson then DDT'd his own partner and posted Savage, and Flair pinned Guerrero. Flair and Anderson held Savage, and Elizabeth slapped him in the face. Anderson then DDT'd Savage on the floor, and Flair stomped him. This is big on heat, three and a quarter stars. It's a little silly thing, but if you're a longtime wrestling fan, you love the idea that Flair and Arn are holding Savage so Liz can slap him. This was good stuff, and at this point, the best thing on the show. Was it the best thing on the show so far? Yeah, I think it, it, it had to be at this point, yeah. Well, I mean, I love the Steiner interaction, but as far as the overall match, I think this was better just because Booty Man. At this it. point. Yes. I, I, yeah. Actually, my, my favorite match is going to take place shortly on, on this card. Oh, but... I know what you like. I can guess. Well, okay, guess. Come on. Humor me. I, I think you're into the Brad Armstrong deal. I like that one a lot, but that wasn't my favorite. My favorite was Conan and Liger. How about these guys tearing it up here? Um, we should mention Eddie Guerrero is in the best shape of his career here, and he's fresh off of a torn peck. But he uses that time away clearly to, uh, you know, do what he can in other areas, including his diet. And this is probably the best Eddie had looked at this point. It is, you know, now I, I'm going to be judicious in how I say this, but it, you know, you look at superstars now in the ring and a lot of it has to do with diet and, you know, knowing more about working out and, and conditioning, you know, the, everything has advanced so much over the last 20 years. And I'm sure training and, and working out has too, in terms of the ways people do it. But I, I think 
when wrestlers back in the 80s and 90s, when the emphasis was on, you know, being as big as you possibly could. And um, I, I think that hurt a lot of careers. You know, you look at Eddie here, look how fast he is, look how fluid he is. Uh, I think later on, as he got bigger and bigger and bigger, it actually, you know, took a toll on him, you know, inside of the ring. Look, when you're born, you have a certain set of genetics. You have, you, 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 you're, your bone structure, your cartilage, your ligaments, all of those things that no matter how hard you train, you really can't improve upon all that much. And then when you put on 20, 25, 35, 40 pounds of muscle or more in some cases, that's a lot of stress on knees and joints and, you know, soft tissue that you can't really improve upon by working out harder and gaining weight uh, or putting on size. So, I, I, I'm, I like what I see today in many respects because guys are just in much better condition overall and they're not as big as they used to be. And some of them are naturally, but they've got the bone structure and the genetics to support it. it you know, it's like me. I, you know, if I was in shape, I probably wouldn't weigh more than 185 pounds, uh, maybe less. Uh, but for me, if I decided I wanted to get big and go out and get myself up to 240 or 250 pounds, even if it looked good from the outside, you know, that's a whole lot of pressure on, like I say, bones, ligaments, you know, my body frame that isn't built to handle it. So that's a long winded way of agreeing with you. Eddie looked like he was in great shape here. And I think his work reflected that. Not that he wasn't great afterwards. He certainly was. He had fantastic matches, but I liked him a little leaner and a little faster. Eddie Guerrero, of course, is, um, one of the, oh, I don't know. What would you say? All time WCW, you know, if he hadn't left and WCW would have continued, I kind of think he would have been before you guys were done in line for the big belt. I mean, don't you think he could have tore it up with Booker T or, or do you think he would have always been a rung lower just based on the way his perception was in the company? In all honesty, I don't think he would have, we would have ever given that opportunity to, to be a world champion. I'm not happy to say that. I'm not proud of it. Um, I'm just you know being honest about the, the perception, uh, within the, the wrestling industry at that time, including in the WWF, by the way, well, that but- certainly changed later, but we're talking about 1997, 1998, 1999. I, I don't know that our company, I mean, it's hard to say, would we have evolved? Would we have gotten to the point where uh, we realize that the audience doesn't really care if someone is six foot six and 300 pounds? Maybe we would have, I don't know. It's kind of hard to say. Well, here's why I asked that though. If you know, before it's all done, Benoit got a chance. I mean, Benoit was the world champ and I know he forfeited the next day and he, and he went home, but to me, you know, Benoit and, and, and Eddie Guerrero, same, same as far as in ring. Yeah. But I, you know, what, what was the reasoning behind Benoit getting that title? What was the logic behind it? I don't think it was, again, I wasn't not clear on what the backstage politics and the reasoning was as I sit here and do this podcast, but I'm almost convinced as I sit here without knowing any other information that it was probably more politics than anything else. Not because anybody saw him as a guy who could carry the company and be a world heavyweight champion for any length of time. I mean, it's one thing to put a belt on a guy or put the world championship on a guy, uh, for a short period of time as a transition or to elevate that character for a period of time. Uh, there's a big difference in that and putting the championship on, on a particular performer because you really feel that you can build a business long-term around it. I doubt that anybody really thought that they could build a business long-term around Chris Benoit as the world champion. All righty. Just my opinion. No, I mean, I I could... my, I'm not mad at it. Listen, I appreciate you sharing it. By the way, we're talking over a really, really good match. You should go out of your way to see it. Uh, if you're going to watch one match on this show, I, I think it should probably be this one. Uh, they only go six minutes and 40 seconds, but tons of false finishes, lots of pinning combinations. They're trying to pull out all the stops here and they're doing a good job. 
they did a good job, and these two guys had a lot of backstory together. Uh, bam, Eddie Guerrero, nice drop kick. Yeah, you won the title, but you're going to eat my boots. I like this. Get a little heat back. Come on, get a little heat back. Um, I think you know the audience knew that when you got in the ring, when, when these two guys got in the ring, that they were going to have a hell of a match and be highly entertained, just because of the backstory and their history. Holy smokes, Eddie Guerrero! That's a creative way to get your heat back, coming off the top rope. Well, yeah, with a with a hell of a frog splash on top of the cruiserweight title, it gets three and a quarter stars, much like the match before it. But for me. You know, it's, uh, it's getting the job done. Well, something that won't be harmful or hurtful for you is our friends at Henson shaving. These guys really have made the best razor we've ever used. And we're all sort of in on the deal. We understand it's just the way life is that when things are better, they cost more. Well, Henson, man, they've done something really special and really rare. Not only is it better than what you've been doing, it's also more affordable and it wasn't even their original plan. You see, these cats are an aerospace parts manufacturer. It's a family business, but they've made making parts for the international space station on the Mars Rover. And now they're using their aerospace grade CNC machines to make the thinnest razors you've ever seen. How thin? Well, how about thinner than a human hair? And they've built a razor here that has built in channels to evacuate hair and cream, which makes clogging virtually impossible. And I know what you're saying to yourself, self, why do I care how thin the razor is? We see razor blades are like diving boards. The longer the board, the more the wobble and the more the wobble, well, the more likely you are to get nicks, cuts, and scrapes. You see a bad shave isn't a bad blade problem. It's an extension problem, but they've solved all that here. Not only that, they've created the best razor, not the best razor business. There's no plastic here. There's no subscriptions. There's no proprietary blade. In fact, it works with a standard dual edge blade that well, every professional wrestler is very familiar with. And there's no planned obsolescence. You see what this has here is the standard dual edge blade. I'm talking about a Henson razor that gives you that old school feel, but all the benefits of new school tech. Not only that though, this is where they really win the pony. If you will, it's only like three to $5 a year to replace the blades. Think about that. Normally when you go down to the drugstore, they keep the razor blade cartridges behind lock and key. You have to ask an associate with a key to go unlock it. You don't do that anywhere else in the drugstore, but you do here when it comes to razor blades, not anymore. You see, once you own the razor and this is a razor that will last you a lifetime, it's three to $5 a year. Let's say no to subscriptions and yes to a razor that will truly last a lifetime. Visit hensonshavingcom slash Eric, pick the razor for you and use the code Eric. That's E R I C. And you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just be sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades. When you head to H E N S O N S H A V I N G dot com slash Eric and use the promo code Eric. Speaking of action and what's going on, it's Guerrero and Benoit, and these guys are tearing it down. You got to love just being able to plug these two guys in for about 15 minutes and knowing they're going to put on a, a classic match. Yeah, you're going to see a clinic every single time. You're, you're going to see a clinic and this is absolutely no exception. So it would be announced during this match here, Eric, that, uh, Ric Flair and Eddie Guerrero are going to face off for the United States belt at hog wild. Uh, who's coming up with Eddie taking on flair. Is this, is this your idea? So Kevin Sullivan's idea, or is it just, you know, is flair pushing for this in terms of the next step in his story as the U S champion? Does he want to give some guys a rub here that are up and comers? I, I, I would point to Kevin Sullivan. You okay. know, I think what Kevin was trying to do and I think did successfully was elevate guys like Eddie by getting them a little more experience with some of the more with the higher profile talent, getting the rub as they say in the industry, you know, as great as Eddie was, Eddie was relatively new to the mass American audience Not saying they hadn't, people hadn't seen him before. I know he had been other places, but had very limited exposure to the national primetime viewing audience. And you want to help elevate talent like that at this point in his career. I got to keep saying that because dipshits like that guy that asked the question about the one good idea, <laughs> yes. you know, you got to say things over and over and over again to them. It's like training a fucking it's dog. Sometimes. The key to learning repetition. No, do not piss on the carpet. No, do not piss on the carpet. So 
Yeah. One of the things you'd have to do sometimes is, is take a guy like Eddie and go, okay, let's, let's have it because you know, he's going to have a great match with Ric Flair and you know, Ric Flair is going to put him over and make him look like a million dollars. And I'm, I venture to guess it's a guess at this point that that's what Kevin was thinking. Yeah. Next up, we've got diamond Dallas page. He is the battle bowl ring champion. They're calling him the battle bowl champion, but really it's the ring. And, uh, Eddie Guerrero is going to be here challenging for it. Eddie's not yet over with the crowd, but man, he's one of the best wrestlers in the world. Diamond Dallas page also probably not over with the crowd, but they're at least responding to the diamond cutter, but that's not a part of the match. The frog splash comes out of nowhere and Eddie Guerrero gets the pin and wins the battle bowl ring. Meltzer would say it was a good match, but too short. But after the match. Uh, Diddy P hit not one, but two diamond cutters before Chavo Guerrero comes in to make the save, but that doesn't keep Eddie from taking a third diamond cutter. This one off the top rope and, uh, the diamond cutters over it's getting big pops and big reactions from the crowd. I dug it. What'd you think? I really enjoyed watching it, but probably for different reasons. You know, I, you know, love DDP he's, he's a close friend of me and my family. Um, I admire him for what he's really done. He's made a bigger impact, you know, outside of the wrestling business that he did inside. He's had more success outside of the wrestling business than he did inside. And I just admire anybody like that, but especially somebody who's a friend, Eddie, I just, I go back to these matches, you know, in the nineties <clears throat> and in Eddie's case, certainly well into two thousands with WWE. And I'm just, Every time I watch him, I'm in awe. I just don't, I am never not in awe of watching Eddie Guerrero work, whether it was early in WCW or at the peak of his career in WWE. It's just that guy that just makes you go, holy shit. With you. It's like when I watch Muhammad Ali. I, 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 anybody that follows me on social media knows that I'm just a huge fan of Muhammad Ali. There's a picture of him up behind me. There's one with me of... Muhammad Ali um, together in Detroit. I mean, I'm a huge Muhammad Ali fan. And I still, to this day, go back and watch some of his fights. And I'm in awe of him and his abilities. I feel the same way about Eddie Guerrero. You can't watch an Eddie Guerrero match, even if you've seen it a dozen times, and not go, shit, this guy was something way different than you see anywhere. And it's really fun for me. And the reason I, I like this match so much, and it's an example of why or how I don't watch wrestling the way most people do, or some people do. But I'm watching DDP now, and he's still got the, you know, gimmick of the day approach to life. Yeah. His character, it just looked fucking ridiculous. The way he carried himself was ridiculous. It didn't really get heat. It was just, eh. He was just that guy that showed up at a party you didn't really want to throw him out, but you didn't want to be seen with him either. That was kind of like DDP, DDP's character at this point. Um, but it was emerging. Now, as you as you relaying, as you're setting this conversation up, you talk about how, well, DDP's not really over, but man, the diamond cutter's getting a pop. It's getting a pop. Do you really want a heel to get a pop? No, but I'm saying that move's over, and it's a long time since a move has been over. True. True. No, and I and I, I agree with you. I'm 100 percent agreeing with you here. I don't know that I would not have 2020 hindsight. It's free and it's easy, and everybody has it, which is why it doesn't mean shit. But would not this is a what if scenario, you know, hypothetical. What if that diamond cutter would have been Paige had it? you know, practiced it, executed it, perfected it, but saved it till he turned baby face. It would have got gotten, gotten over even more. Yeah. As opposed to introducing but at that a move point, that at obviously that point, got such a trying to get action. Over. People still talk about it. Mostly page. <laughs> Sorry, page, but man, I would have loved to have seen that move, that move be debuted once page got into that baby face man of the people kind of character it would have been even bigger. It's uh interesting booking. You know, it feels like a lot of times, even if, uh, 
you know, when somebody does lose, you know, the, the guy who lost is looking to, I got to get my heat back brother. And, and they accomplished that here. So we're seeing some clips here of uh, Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit. Randy Anderson's our referee. Sadly, everyone on screen is no longer with us, including Benoit's valet woman. That's pretty crazy to think, dude. This was just 25 years ago, and literally every participant no longer with us. Wow, it's yeah, that's a that's a head trick. Um, yeah, <laughs> I thought it. Ooh, it's heavy right out of the shoot. This woman helping Chris Benoit out. Benoit and woman are back here tonight from the tour of Germany. A lot has gone on. A lot has gone down. Here comes Chris Benoit out now, and apparently he is out here by himself. The women's match goes on to Starcade to meet Donna Dallas Page. Where's woman? She's so we got Eddie Guerrero here taking on Chris Benoit in the opening match. Uh, is it uh, that's just just saying that, doesn't it? It sounds weird even now, right? It's unbelievable when you think about just the talent you've got. And, and I know we've talked a lot and Lord, I just absolutely loved when you would open the show with cruiserweights. And I guess maybe somebody somewhere would argue, well, these are technically cruiserweights, but this has got, these have got to be two of the five best wrestlers in the world at this point. And they're the opening match. It's unbelievable. It really is. And I know, as you pointed out, you know, Chris, no longer with us, Eddie, no longer with us. Randy Anderson, no longer with this woman, no longer with this, but in a way they kind of are. Yeah. And, and in a way, when we go back and we watch this stuff, they're with us in a, such a positive way. You know, this is what we want to remember about the, the people that we grew up watching and idolizing or, or just enjoying, you know, as fans, depending on how old you are, obviously, I think the idolization probably, you know, starts to wear off after you're about 18 or 20 for some, for most people, not, not all of them. But here we get to watch Eddie when Eddie was, you know, arguably either at his peak or damn close to it. Uh, Chris Benoit, never been another performer in the ring like him since. I mean, never will be. He was a very unique performer and had his own style and, and signature way of doing things. You know, even his entrance, you know, it was a little bit like Dean Malenko there. Not a lot of emotion, taking it very seriously, setting the tone as he's making his way you know, to, to the ring. It's just, it was all part of the show. And, and Chris's approach to it was very unique, but to be able to see these guys and, 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 and girl uh, performing probably where they were happiest in their life kind of offsets the, the fact that they're no longer with us to me. Maybe some secrets for wealth preservation and whatnot that we can recommend. Thanks to our partner at nationwide coin. This podcast is sponsored by Nationwide Coins, and Nationwide Coins sells government gold at cost. How about that? All new customers receive their first ounce of gold without any dealer markup. Maybe you're not sure where to start. Well, Nationwide Coins has precious metal consultants on staff that you can call. That's right. You heard me. Pick up the phone and call, and they'll help guide you to the right gold purchase for your unique situation. And I have to admit, this is something that my grandfather was, uh, was really into. Uh, but he passed away before I really got a chance to sit under his learning tree, but I'm really glad that now we get somebody we can trust, you know, nationwide coins has thousands of satisfied customers. They've got an A plus with the BBB and they've got 4.6 out of five as their rating over on Trustpilot. So, you know, it's a company they can trust. Nationwide Coins is also proudly partnered with Operation Finally Home, which is a charitable organization that designs and constructs custom homes for veterans in need. Not only that, though, man, they've just got everything you need. Just a wealth of knowledge. Um, the Nationwide Coins is one of the leading precious metal firms in the country. And with over 100 years of combined experience in the industry, I don't think anybody knows more about gold and silver than Nationwide. So whether you're trying to hedge against inflation or, you know, plan for your retirement, why not give nationwide coins a call today? If you're thinking about exploring gold head right now to nationwidecoins.com slash 83 weeks, use our promo code 83 weeks at checkout 
And for your first one ounce gold coin without any dealer markup, that's nationwidecoins.com slash 83 weeks. One last time for this exclusive offer, nationwidecoins.com slash 83 weeks. Use our code 83 weeks and be sure if you call, don't forget to mention our promo code 83 weeks or else they won't know that we sent you. Also want to mention they got free shipping and insurance on all orders. That's nationwidecoins.com slash 83 weeks and use our code 83 weeks. And now Eddie Guerrero is going to uh, jump into the ring here to take on Scott Norton. Talk about some talented uh, in-ring performers here. Uh, I don't know if this is going to be Styles Clash, but we'll see. It's going to be star and a quarter, according to Meltzer. They get five and a half minutes. But we know Eddie Guerrero is one of the best wrestlers in the world. And Scott Norton, a man's man. I love the extra stuff here. You know, way back when you used to have referees in wrestling check the opponents, but Boy, he is being so meticulous as he checks Eddie Guerrero's boots and wrist tape. And it's old school, but fun. It's old school, but fun. And it sets it, yeah, it tells a story right off the bat, you know, opening, opening moments of uh, act one. And it, he, he did a great job. You talk about Scott Norton, you know, people talk today about strong style. Like it's something new, you know, Scott Norton, I think was one of the best representatives of, and, and it was referred to as a strong style back then uh, in New Japan. Scott had so much experience in New Japan, one of Masa Saito's favorite um, American competitors and spent a lot of time over there as a result and worked with some of the top names in Japan. But you're right, man, this is the potentially a clash of styles here on the Clash of Champions because Scott is used to working with real big men in that very stiff, strong style, New Japan style wrestling. And here he's working with, you know, a high flyer in two totally different styles. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. I wanted to ask you about some publicity that WCW was getting at the time. Ray Mysterio and the giant appeared on Regis and Kathy Lee, uh, the day before Hulk Hall and Nash were all on the show. Lots of WCW on a pretty big time show as far as daytime television goes. Regis had had long time had a big time WWF relationship. And now you got WCW stars on the show. How did this come to be? Hulk. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the, you know, there were a lot of reasons why we wanted to bring Hulk Hogan in back in 1994. And we've talked about a lot of those reasons you know, prior, so I won't go through it again, but you know, Hulk had, you know, media relationships and, and, and personal relationships that evolved out of the business side of it that made, you know, getting some of WCW talent on much easier than it would have otherwise been. But that was that was really Hulk and his relationship with, with Regis uh, more than it had anything to do with WCW. And the fact that we were hot helped, but it was really Hulk Hogan was the uh, he was the ambassador for WCW when it came to that kind of thing. I would not want to take a Scott Norton chop. I would not want to take a Scott Norton anything. By the way, Scott Norton, despite his reputation, his abilities, his strength, his power, one of the kindest, gentlest people you'll ever meet. And also one of the funniest. If you ever have a chance, Conrad, to sit down, you know, over a meal and have a couple of cocktails with with a guy and you just want to hear some great stories. Scott Norton's one of the best, man. We, we got to look at him on uh, dark side of the ring when they were covering the North Korea event that we did together. Yeah. You didn't get to see the funny side of Scott there, but, and he is hilarious once you get him going. And so is his wife, his wife, his wife's a riot. She's funny too. At some point here, we're going to have a, uh, a bit of a surprise. So we'll, we'll be sure to track that because it gets a big pop. Let's remind you that eight days prior. Diamond Dallas page turned down the opportunity to join the NWO. Of course, Scott Norton is a part of the NWO proudly representing the NWO, not only here, but in Japan. And of course we've got an NWO referee. So it's NWO style, if you will. And I think we might see an emergence from DDP and man, that diamond cutter is, was already over, but now after he has turned down the NWO and laid out Scott Hall with the diamond cutter and left through the crowd. He is really a made man. Oh, what a power bomb right there. That was, goodness. Oh, that was amazing. 
Good. And if you're going to take a power bomb from somebody and you want the audience to believe it, Scott Norton's the guy to do it. That was Lord. visually, that just looked like it sh shook every bone in Eddie's body loose. Took the wind out of me just watching it. Oh, and Eddie was playing possum drop kick on the Scott Norton as he's perched up top a couple of European uppercuts. And what's Eddie got in mind here? This is an interesting move because so far throughout this match, Eddie was doing the little man, big man thing where he was trying to take Norton out. You saw him earlier on the match, you know, working over Scott's legs, attacking the knees, you know, chopping down the oak tree, uh, as you might say. And here he's kind of going toe to toe with him, you know, Surprised to see him go up in the corner with him, a much bigger guy, but it works. This is a show where we started with Rodman. We got an incoherent uh, Piper promo, an incoherent uh, Flair promo. Someone attacked VK Wall Street. Let's listen to Eddie and Mean Gene here. Uh, either I did talk to some uh, vacationing people here from Michigan. Some uh, I, th I think they're from the University of Michigan, and they're here celebrating spring break. But Eddie Guerrero, they're asking me the question. I think that everybody is. Is it us or is it Eddie Guerrero? What's going on? You know what? I am not the one that is saying I'm a new and improved dresser, am I? No, that's Dean Malenko. That's right. Am I punching and kicking and choking uncharacteristically like somebody I know? Is it? No, you got a point. That's Dean Malenko also. That's right. So who's the person that doesn't seem to be himself hold on wait a second there eddie i'm gonna stop you that's you you don't seem to be yourself hey look days. i'm getting sick and tired of everybody my friends think i'm changing my family thinks i'm changing you think i'm changing look i'm just getting sick and tired of it dean malenko you keep accusing me for your attitude i'm really getting sick and tired of this if anybody made a mistake in this this is you, Dean Malenko, because you know what you did? You told me your game plan. And if you think that I'm going to give mine, well, let me put it to you this way. I'll see you Sunday at Uncensored. Indeed they will. Sunday it's going to be Malenko and Guerrero head on. United. Boy, I know this is the beginning of an Eddie Guerrero heel turn, and he's going to do his best work in WCW to me as a bad guy. But did he evolve as a promo in time or what? He really did. He, he found his feet, so to speak. He wasn't dancing around it. He knew what he wanted to say. He found his character and his confidence just went through the roof. And once you get to that point where you're so confident and you're not afraid of that microphone, you're not afraid of being put on the spot. You're not intimidated by doing a live promo. Once you actually look, start looking forward to doing them, the impact that confidence has on you, and the quality of your promos is amazing because you're no longer memorizing every single thing you're supposed to say. You're allowing yourself to feel the things that you're saying. And once you can start actually feeling it and you're not concentrating on memorizing it, the audience feels it with you. And that's where it all changes. I just had this conversation with Tony about old school JCP last week. I want to ask you this week in hindsight, would you have preferred that we do the interviews with the guys before the match, as opposed to after the match, I think Eddie could have said, Hey, everybody wants to say I've changed, watch this match and see if I wrestle the same way I always did. See if I'm taking shortcuts, see if I pull the hair, or hold the tights or, but my point is, I think after a match, sometimes the guys <laughs> mean, gee, but he can't catch his breath. He's blown up. And so maybe he's not at his best promo wise and he's not in his best entertainment wise when he's trying to catch his breath in hindsight, should we always try to do it before, as opposed to after when we can, I, I don't think there's any, you know, one way to do things. It always depends on the talent and it depends on the situation. I like the fact that talent is blown up. I, Cause that feels real to me. It does feel real. And the level of emotion, particularly with less experienced talent. And at this point, Eddie was finding his way in terms of promos in the ring. He was at home. He could, he could have a great match in his sleep, but with a microphone in front of him and, and the red camera, right in his red light of the camera, right in his face, he wasn't his home at that point. But when you get somebody who's, 
great in the ring and maybe not so great in a promo, getting that real emotion from, from them post-match is often better than anything that you're going to get from them pre-match. That's my opinion. It's a matter of taste. But again, I think you got to mix it up, and it depends on the situation and the talent. Well, let's talk about uh, the LWO. It's formed around this same time, led by Eddie Guerrero. Talk to me about how the LWO comes to be. We would see them start to try to uh, recruit Ray Mysterio, and he's going to deny him. I'm going to do my best to recall as many of the details as I can on this idea. Um, I think I got most of it down pretty well, but uh, I was in Los Angeles for a meeting with Mandalay Sports and Entertainment. At the time, Jason, and by the way, a little background on Mandalay Sports and Entertainment. Owned by a gentleman by the name of Peter Goober. Yep, Peter Goober. G-U-B-E-R. Interesting kind of quirky name, Goober. But one of the most successful people in the entertainment business at that time. He's a former chairman uh, of, of Sony Pictures. He currently, I believe, is part owner in uh, Los Angeles Dodgers. His studio, Mandalay, Mandalay uh, Entertainment and then Mandalay Sports and Entertainment, two different companies under the same umbrella, uh, has probably produced some of the top feature films of, that you've seen um, over the last 20 years. So very, very successful guy. And I had a meeting there um, at Mandalay Sports and Entertainment. Jason Hervey was there at the time, and we went out to lunch, and I believe we were – we were either in a Greek restaurant or a Mexican restaurant. I can't remember which, but that's when we got into the conversation about, you know, the NWO and how successful uh, it was and, you know, on and on and on. We're talking about that. And I think it was Jason Hervey that actually came up with the idea of the Latino world order. He, and I, I don't know if he threw it out. It, it was, you know, Jason wasn't working for us at the time. He was, again, he was working for Mandalay sports and entertainment. But, you know, we were friends and Jason was obviously a big wrestling fan. And Jason and I had some you know projects together during that period of time. And he threw the idea out there. And I'm not sure if he threw it out as a joke or if he was serious about it or a little bit of both. But nonetheless, it kind of took on. And, I you know, I talked to Eddie about it. And I, I, Eddie was pretty uh, – he thought it was a pretty cool idea. He got excited about it. And there you go. Well, something I know that is a joy of yours, Eric – is you love getting out, you love meeting the fans, you love spending time with them, and you're going to get to do that again. Wrestlecade weekend right around the corner. It's a three-day family-friendly convention for fans of wrestling and sports entertainment. It brings together more than 125 of your favorite different wrestling stars from all eras. They've got live pro wrestling pay-per-views all three days. They've got meet and greets with your favorite wrestling stars. They've got question and answer panels. They've got live wrestling podcasts. They've got costume contests. They've got wrestling-related merch for sale and so much more. It's all happening at the Benton Convention Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, November 24th to November 26th. And our very own Eric Bischoff will be on-site representing adfreeshows.com. And be sure to check out a live version of Extreme Life of Matt Hardy as Matt and John Alba will be on stage that Friday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, Tickets are on sale now, so you can meet Eric Bischoff and uh, see him in person. Bring your your camera, bring your old WCW and WWE merch. Pictures and autographs abound. Here we go. WrestleCade.com is where you can get those tickets. That's WrestleCade.com. That's WrestleCade.com. Well, let's get to the, the real main event of this entire show. It's Rey Mysterio Jr. and Eddie Guerrero. And if you're going to watch one match this week, that's not on current TV. Go out of your way to watch this one. You won't see any better. Uh, the wrestling observer reader poll. It was a runaway for the best match on the card. They had 147 votes. 140 of them were for this match. I don't know how this is possible. Meltzer only gave it four and three quarter stars. This is uh, this to me is, is a five star or better. If such a thing exists, what a story it's video game shit. They're doing in this it's 13 minutes and 51 seconds for the cruiserweight title and Ray Mysterio gets the win. I, I don't know that we can put this over enough, uh, or, or talk intelligently enough to properly convey just how special this was, but there is a really remarkable 
segment midway through the match where they've got, they're doing like a test of strength. So both hands are clenched and then they start to involve their feet and Mysterio goes to the top rope and then does a flip into a reverse DDT. And it is video game level stuff, one hot spot after another, but it, they told a story the entire way. It's not just flips and dives for the sake of flips and dives. And I'm not shitting on flips and dives. I'm a big fan of that too, but this was remarkably well done. Uh, I can't put it over enough. I've just got to say, go watch it. I'm sure you feel the same way. Damn. This is, this was so incredible. I think this may have been, if this is not the best Eddie Guerrero representative of some of Eddie Guerrero's finest work ever and Ray Mysterio's finest work ever. I don't know what is. I know they've had bigger matches. They, you know, they, they each had higher profile matches and, you know, were part of WrestleManias and all those other wonderful things. But in terms of the quality of the match, I, I really mean this. I challenge anybody to go to WWE Network, go to Halloween Havoc 1997, watch this match, and then please re- reach out to me on social media at eBischoff on Twitter and let me know if you think you've seen a better match than this match in the last 20 years, not a bigger match, a better match. This this was, this is, that was a classic. It is still a classic matchup that I think anybody that's, that's in the industry today really, they owe themselves the benefit of, of spending 20 or 30 minutes and going back and watching this match because it has it all. It has unbelievably incredible athletic presentation um the timing the christmas the psychology the characters i mean eddie guerrero had so much heat during this match and and even though he lost the match maintained his heat at the very end you know ray mysterio was over like a son of a bitch because of what they did in the ring and the way they told their stories and the way they managed their characters and presented those characters, it was just, it's a classic to this day. I, I, I don't know that I've seen a better match I mean, I of this, of this style. You know what I mean? How about this? I'm going to say something here. We've never really talked about. I think this is the best match that happened in WCW while you were running the company. I, I don't disagree. Uh, I, I don't disagree from a pr- presentation point of view. It wasn't the biggest match. It didn't draw the most money. It didn't change the course of the wrestling industry, but damn, it probably was not probably it was, I think the best match that we've ever put on. And I think it's set more importantly, I think it set the tone for the next, when was this 1997, 2007, 2007 for the next 25 years, this match is this is a bar that I don't think anybody objectively could look at this match and say that they could point to another match in recent times. That's as good as this all the way around, all the way around again. I want to be sure I'm clear here. Yes. There's been bigger matches. Yes. There's been matches with more emotion behind them. Yes. There's been bigger main event matches that have drawn more money, but please, please point me to a match that move for move minute for minute, second for second, could come close to what, what you will see in this match. It's really incredible. And that's, it's not because of me. It's that was Eddie Guerrero and Ray Mysterio. You know, I'm not patting myself on the back for this. This was all them. It was such a fantastic match. All right, boys and girls, that'll do it for us this week here on 83 weeks. We hope you've appreciated our stroll down memory lane. We tried to pay Eddie Guerrero as much justice as we could, uh, and celebrate such an incredible person an incredible performer. Man, just gone way too soon. I can't imagine the legacy and how that legacy would have grown and continued to grow uh, has, had he been with us. Imagine how much fun he'd be having with everything that's happening with WWE and AEW these days. It, it really is something else. Uh, I want to remind you, by the way, if you haven't already, advertise with Eric.com is where you can get your men 25 to 54. You hear some of the same sponsors on our program over and over and over. Why is that? Well, because it really works. By the way, the easiest and cheapest way to support the show is to check us out on YouTube. That's pretty easy. That's uh, 83 weeks on youtube.com. Just hit the like and subscribe button. 83 weeks on youtube.com. Of course, love to have your questions. We're actually taking your questions for next week's topic right now over on Twitter at 83 weeks. 
Also got plenty of uh, merch available for you as well over at boxofgimmicks.com. And of course, if you haven't already, I highly recommend that you check out Eric Bischoff's grant brand new book. Uh, it's been out for less than a year now. Uh, grateful it's available now and you can find it on Amazon. Just look for grateful by Eric Bischoff and, uh, Eric and I will be back next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. We'll be talking about the good, the bad, and the ugly of professional wrestling right here on 83 weeks with Eric Bischoff. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson here to tell you a little more about what adfreeshows.com is all about. Get early ad-free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every single week, starting at just nine bucks. That's less than 20 cents an episode each month. And yes, you can listen to them all directly through Apple Podcasts or your regular podcast apps. How easy is that? Ad-Free Shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docu-series like Title Chase, Eric Fires Back, Conversations with Conrad, and The Insiders. Plus, new series like The Book with David Crockett, Monday Mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick, and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early? You can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus, ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch-alongs, Q&As, and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now, see for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today, and hey, when you do, the first week is completely free, adfreeshows.com.